Welcome, Bill. We're glad to have you here. Thanks, Bob. I definitely appreciate Appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak here today and tell you a bit about um, some of the technology we've developed at Ruckus and uh, how it's evolved over the years. Um, I really like an interactive format, so if anyone has any questions at any point, uh, feel free to get my attention. Uh, also uh, on Adobe Connect as well, happy to take questions from there. Uh, so at any point, just uh, just uh, get my attention, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions you have. So. Like actually, one of the first things I learned at CMU, we had this class, um, technology and people. It's all the engineering students were required to take this. It's called philosophy of engineering, and um, you know it seemed like a distraction at the time. But you know, one very important thing is defining the problem, and that's really the whole purpose of this course was actually to make you stop before you did any engineering and uh, define the problem. And I think it was probably the only engineering class I had uh, at CMU that uh, had essay questions. <laughs> And uh, it, it, my recollection was, wh whatever the question was, the answer was define the problem. <laughs> so, um, so I'll start here with uh, defining the problem. And I'll actually sort of revise the problem statement as, as we go through. And so uh, to sort of set the framework for the problem, I have a, a short little video and sound clip here from uh, YouTube. Hopefully we can watch. Um, who, who remembers modems? And uh, you know, maybe this is uh, predating uh, some folks. But uh, this used to be a ritual for, for connecting to the internet and the stuff that came before the internet, this whole sort of uh, Acoustic dance between these two endpoints, trying to negotiate, amongst other things, the uh, the data rate that they're actually going to use for the communication. And uh, you know, modems only had a very small number of uh, different data rates that they could actually use. Uh, and so it was actually a pretty simple problem. And you can, uh, you know, the solutions they were basically stepping down rates. You know, they'd, they'd try with a high rate, and if that didn't work, uh, you know, sort of step down uh, to to lower ones. And so. Um, the simplest version of the problem statement that I'm trying to talk about today is uh, we're trying to do something about a, a thousand times harder, and we're trying to do it, you know, maybe a thousand times a second. <laughs> so that's kind of the the, the background. These, this negotiation, not necessarily a negotiation, but optimization of the parameters that you're actually going to be using for this this communication. And uh, as as we'll see, it's not just data rate parameters. We we introduce other parameters. Um, so. Just to tell you a bit about my background and sort of how I uh, came to be working on this particular problem, um, as Bob mentioned, I uh, graduated out of CMU in 1993, computer engineering. Um, did a lot of different networking stuff all throughout my my time there. Um, I think I was building routers and you know router hardware and software pretty much by my sophomore year, and uh, doing research and publishing papers, um, undergrad research um, while I was there as well. Uh, it was Pretty much set to come out to California and Stanford and start working on my master's and PhD, and uh, interviewed at exactly one company, uh, and that company was Four Systems, which was uh, actually founded by uh, some CMU professors and researchers that was uh, just really getting going and starting to uh, get some amazing traction. And uh, I knew eventually I wanted to do startups, so against the uh, advice of Advisors and other folks that I work with, we thought I was crazy for not coming out to Stanford. I, I joined this, this startup, uh, and I was lucky enough to be this sort of the first switch software group there, first first um, engineer in the switch software group. And um, you know, fortunately, a, a little while later, the company went public, and it turned out to be the right decision because it sort of set me on this path of uh, sort of seeing how startups work and uh, you know being a significant contributor to them. Um, after that. Did a number of other various uh, startups out here in the valley as an early employee, uh, and then around uh, 2002 timeframe, started looking to do something on my own, and was really prototyping lots of different things in my uh, at home. I was playing around with um, like video and storage and peer-to-peer -peer networks, and you know what's what, what's after TiVo, what's what's next for digital media sort of stuff, and. I knew these things wanted to have a wireless interface to them. You know, 802.11 was just starting to, you know, show up on the on the uh, shelves at Fry's, and you know, I, I jammed these uh, networking cards and these little little PCs that I was using to prototype these applications, and I just wanted it to work like Ethernet. <laughs> and uh, you know, I just come from an optical networking company before that, and you know, this stuff, optical network, is just so reliable until the backhoe comes along, it just works, right? And here. 
you know, I just wanted it to be like that. I just wanted it to work, and it just never worked, basically. And I was spending more and more of my time trying to make the wireless work. I knew that you know, these, these applications were going to be wireless, and I just wanted it to work like Ethernet, but yet it just it basically never worked. And so I was like, whoa, hold on. Until this problem is solved, like this whole glorious digital media future is just not going to uh, really happen because it's going to have to be wireless, and this wireless is just nowhere ready for prime time yet. And so through you know, various uh, conversations I was having with folks up and down Sand Hill Road, um, got hooked up with uh, another, fo another, fo another guy, uh, my co-founder Victor Strom, uh, who was also kind of orbiting around uh, Sand Hill Road looking for something to do in the wireless space. Um, and we were encouraged to work together because Sequoia really wanted to uh, do things in the wireless video space. They didn't know what, and they thought maybe it was chips or something because they do a lot of uh, silicon investments historically. And uh, they were really encouraging us to, um, to look at that area. And so we, we camped out there for about a year and a half and um, started prototyping stuff and building stuff. And uh, that eventually became uh, Ruckus. And so I'll, I'll talk more about the history of Ruckus later, but just wanted to give you sort of a quick background on how I came to work on, on this particular problem. So Ruckus is primarily a Wi-Fi company. Um, we dabble in some other uh, technologies, and uh, but primarily most of our products today are, are, are Wi-Fi. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of 802.11 as it currently um, stands and sort of, sort of where it's going. Um, the thing about Wi-Fi that makes it interesting, it has a couple, a couple really interesting things. It's, this, it has to operate in this crazy unlicensed spectrum, you know. It's a, the exact polar opposite of a fiber, which is the most controlled perfect environment for, uh, you know, photons you can imagine. Here we have just the absolute opposite. Anyone can basically go down and down a fries, buy gear that operates in unlicensed spectrum, Wi-Fi or, or otherwise, and, and, and throw it up. And you have to deal with this. And in urban areas, like the, the superposition of all these Linksys access points, all the microwaves, all of this, everything. It's just a, uh, just a crazy environment to operate in. And so th that's, that alone is an interesting problem. But now consider like the fact that Wi-Fi is the connectivity fabric, the sort of de facto connectivity fabric for, for most devices. And there's, you know, at this point, there's 4 billion Wi-Fi devices in the world. And that, that doesn't even count the ones that have been retired. That's the sort of the active devices expecting to go much higher. Your, your R&D investment, your investment in silicon is amortized over this just incredible array of devices. And so that means the amount of R&D you can actually put in, and actually the amount of R&D you have to put in to stay competitive is just phenomenal. So the amount of technology packed into a modern Wi-Fi, SOC, baseband radio, all integrated into one, uh, is just really crazy. So you have this hard problem, but you also have a lot of technology feeding into this problem. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the Mac layer and the Phi layer to sort of set the stage for the problem that, uh, that we're solving here. Um, the 811 Mac layer is, is pretty unique um, as these things go. It has some interesting characteristics that allow it to operate in these uh, uncertain environments. And the, the Phi layer is also uh, quite advanced, quite modern. Uh, it continues to advance uh, rapidly just due to the amount of R&D dollars that, that uh, can flow into this ecosystem. So here's what I like to think of as uh, seven weird little tricks that make Wi-Fi work. I promise I won't make you click through uh, each one of them. Um, so Wi-Fi is, unlike some cellular networks, it's unscheduled TDMA. It's no one is coordinating the Wi-Fi network. It's all on one channel, and transmissions and receive uh, and reception is essentially half duplex. And so um, you know that's that's one interesting aspect of it. Um, the key thing that keeps uh, transmissions from clobbering each other, you're doing two types of, of uh, channel assessment. You're doing it based on sort of a carrier, a carrier sense. Can I, can I see something that looks like a Wi-Fi signal? I should, I should probably not transmit. And there's also just a pure energy sense. Is there enough energy here that I probably shouldn't transmit because it would be worthless? Um, all, the, all the chipsets implement those two type of uh, sort of clear channel assessment. You have this randomized component. You're, you're, backing off your transmissions randomly to help desynchronize transmissions and uh, 
it was a very simple adaptive window sizing that, you know, simple enough that it can be built into the hardware. Basically, if your last transmission failed, just double the amount of time that you uh, randomize your next window so that uh, to sort of decrease the probability of another collision. Here's the one that I think is probably the, the most key aspect of Wi-Fi and actually um, sets the stage for the types of optimizations that we're going to be doing here. You have this immediate feedback. Uh, in, in any sort of adaptation, the feedback is, is super critical. And here, the Wi-Fi has this immediate feedback built into the sort of the reptilian brain of the Wi-Fi chipset. It's not something software does. It's like a reflex action of the chipset. I do a transmission, and then in a very dedicated time slot, immediately after that transmission, an act comes back if, if the, uh, the frame was properly received. And so the fact that this is in hardware, you know, basically a required part of the standard, and um, this just this reflex action of the Wi-Fi in this protected time slot uh, essentially makes it a, a very reliable acknowledgement mechanism. You might think, hey, hey, there's TCP acknowledgements. Why do I need this Wi-Fi stuff? Well, you need this Wi-Fi feedback for the adaptations I'm going to talk about. You also need it for the next thing on this list here, the, the retransmissions. Wi-Fi does have this, uh, in any real environment, a, a dramatic uh, packet error rate, you know, 10, 20, 30, we see 50% in some environments. Uh, TCP just really can't deal with that as soon as there's any sort of latency involved. And so you need this retransmission at the, uh, at the Mac layer to actually make this all work. There's an optional uh, RTS-CTS mode uh, for when things get really bad. Um, and then we added in aggregation with uh, block acts so that you get some level of efficiency here in practice. So 811-Phi, um, if you study phi's, this, this should be, um, this should seem pretty straightforward. It's OFDM, which uh, you know basically you, bring, you cut the band up into little chunks and you send uh, data on each of the subcarriers. It has a lot of nice um, characteristics for when you're dealing in uh, certain multipath environments. We're operating in both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. We have channels 20, 40, 80 megahertz, and with 11 AC, <coughs> we're actually moving up to 160 megahertz channel soon. Uh, modulations up to 256 QAM. Uh, lots of 3x3 MIMO systems shipping currently, and we'll have 4x4 uh, with 802.11 AC Wave 2 soon. Transmit beamforming is part of the standard. Kind of uh, loosely implemented, uh, sorry, not, not ubiquitously implemented yet, but uh, that should be changing soon as well. And we also have multi-user MIMO uh, queued up here in, in uh, Wave 2 of 11 AC. I'll talk a bit more about a couple of these here. Um, it's interesting to note uh, sort of the dates at which certain technology became available in both Wi-Fi and cellular context. And you see that it actually leads in Wi-Fi. And uh, I like to think, again, this is due to the, the mass consumer appeal of Wi-Fi. No one subsidizes Wi-Fi equipment. You know, it's um, consumers go out to their fries and buy it. It's, uh, there's just massive consumer demand for it. And that drives that R&D spend, which really allows the technology to appear in Wi-Fi uh, even sooner than it does in, in cellular networks. Perhaps I'm a little bit of a Wi-Fi bigot. but uh, don't let that, don't let that influence. Uh. So I'm going to drill down here into some of the uh, the details of the things that we're actually trying to optimize here. Um, we have these different physical layer data rates, and if if you're not really familiar with uh, how wireless fires work, you can sort of abstract this away as as kind of like being different gears on a car. It's not quite the right analogy, but um, it is in some sense that there's generally one gear you want to be in for a particular condition that you're, you're encountering. Um, for the benefit of those who may not have seen these types of things before, um, we have in the 811 AG standard different modulations, uh, essentially how many symbols you're trying to transmit in a given uh, time period. Then you have the coding, which is the uh, sort of the error correction on top of that to help make it more reliable. And basically, Based on those two things, number of subcarriers, you can calculate out a, uh, um, a particular data rate that you, you're able to achieve. In 11 A and G, these data rates um, vary from 6 megabits up to 54 megabits. So fast forward a few years, and this is what we get in 11 N. Well, this certainly looks a lot more interesting. Um, so in addition to our previous encodings that we have, uh, we've gained a, a slightly more aggressive coding rate. Um, and we've added these additional spatial streams. Now this is uh, what's commonly referred to as, as MIMO. We are using multiple antennas and the reflections through the environment 
to effectively allow you to transmit multiple data streams in parallel. Uh, these are speculative techniques in the sense that you're not ever really guaranteed to be able to send a certain number of streams to the environment. The environment has to interact with the antennas in such a way that it permits you to do that. It's kind of a, you have to have a decorrelated channel, a sufficiently decorrelated channel for you to have these multiple paths through the, uh, through the environment. And of course, the, the, the transmitters and receivers have to have sufficient number of antennas to, to support this as well. Uh, so we've also added 40 megahertz channelization in 11A, uh, sorry, 11N. Um, and we've added options for two different guard intervals. So if you have very favorable um, multipath conditions, you can use a more aggressive guard interval, which gets you a little bit of extra uh, performance. And so now we have this space that we need to select through. Um, we may have been able to shift gears manually when we had those uh, uh, you know, eight or so that we had with uh, 11G. But now imagine driving a car or bicycle with this many gear choices. That starts to seem a little more daunting. Um, before showing you that same graph, uh, same chart for 11AC, uh, I'll introduce a couple of the concepts that uh, 11AC is, um, is is working with, just to kind of uh, uh, give you a bit of info on that. Uh, so this is the 5 gigahertz uh, spectrum. I think probably fairly accurate uh, view of it. I think there may be some more channels that are being opened up here soon. Um, you have the 20 megahertz channelization, the 40 that we had in uh, 11N, and now in 11AC, we get these 80 megahertz and even 160 megahertz uh, options. Uh, so that's, uh, that's you know, where some of the raw um, uh, throughput comes from. But the key thing is that you know, even when you're using an 80 megahertz channelization, you may not necessarily want to transmit every frame at 80 megahertz. There may be clients that are further away that don't have a sufficient power density uh, sufficient signal strength, essentially, the, to enable them to use that uh, higher channelization. So even if the radio is operating in an 80 megahertz channelization, there may be many cases where you still want to transmit in a 40 or a 20 megahertz um, uh, fire rate. So those choices all still exist. Um, <clears throat> wave 2 of, of 11AC is coming out here in the next year or so. Uh, and this introduces a, a variation of the MIMO um, uh, scheme where instead of sending the spatial streams to different um, to different uh, devices, we're sending them simultaneously to sorry, previously we're sending these streams to the same device. Now we're sending these streams to different devices simultaneously. So for the first time, uh, Edif 11 grows the ability to talk to multiple devices sort of essentially simultaneously using uh, multi-user MIMO. Uh, this you'll you'll start to see uh, APs that support this in the next year or so. So now looking at that same sort of chart with 11AC, uh, the phi rates that we have available, uh, this is what this looks like. So we've grown a couple new um, modulations and coding. We actually now support 256 QAM. And we've grown this additional 80 megahertz um, uh, channelization. So our, our sort of our rate space has, has grown yet again. Uh, this seems to be a trend. And I think we'll expect to see this, uh, this continuing. Here's what this looks like um, just all on one, one page from the standpoint of uh, where we've come from with the original 11A, 8 of 11 standard, which um, I don't think was ever really uh, popular. 11B is sort of where people started becoming aware of it. It had four rates, uh, growing to around 98 and 11N. Currently, 11AC implementations, depending on the chipset, support somewhere in the range of 180 to 288. The actual 11AC standard supports up to 576 have actually been standardized. So that's uh, what we'll eventually get to under the umbrella of 11AC, potentially several years down the road. Um, right now, the standardization effort for the next generation has just begun. Next generation of Wi-Fi, that's under the moniker 11AX. Um, not clear exactly. Uh, where that's going to end up, but uh, I think it's safe to say it's probably in the range of a thousand different fire rates that you'll have there. Um, and now consider just the range of, of, of throughputs that you have to consider. Um, again, growing in a similar pattern, 2 megabits, uh, 11 megabits. Now we have stuff that, uh, you know, stuff you can buy today does 1300 uh, within the next year. That'll bump up a bit. Um, AX, it's still you know very early days for that standard, but it's likely to come in somewhere around 10 to 14 megabits. The key thing here is that you know this is the rate that the best clients get. The worst clients are still getting you know 
down in the single digit megabits. So the, the range of conditions, the range of operating um, throughputs that you have to adapt to has, has grown widely. It's not that all of your clients have grown by a thousand, you know, by hundreds or, or a thousand. It's not like the slowest clients doing uh, 100 megabits now. The slowest clients are still out at the edge of the of the of this radio cell or the um, access points limit, and it's still doing you know two megabits. So you have this dramatically increasing range of conditions, range of throughputs that you actually have to deal with. So now we have enough uh, sort of background to have a more serious problem statement. Um, so really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to select the 811 physical layer data rate on a per client, per transmission basis to maximize goodness. And we'll, we'll, we'll decide later what, what goodness is. But um, the key points here is that we have to select from that table on every transmission. And we have to do it for every client, because obviously each client has different channel conditions that needs to be taken into account. So before I get into sort of the, uh, the uh, uh, further formulation of this problem, I'll talk a little bit more about um, the history of ruckus and, and how we, got, we came to sort of be working on this problem. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we incubated at Sequoia Capital for about a year and a half before we uh, sort of figured out enough of a plan to, to go off and start executing. Um, we originally were called Video 54 because, well, 54 was the highest fire rate at that time. And it seemed, it seemed kind of cool, like maybe Studio 54. I don't know. We we've, uh, imagined ourselves as some sort of, a, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, so that was. Uh, where we got started. We were actually initially focused on IPTV. Um, around this time, IPTV was starting to be deployed in many countries, uh, not so much in the US, but in Europe and Asia. It uh, um, was a much more popular um, technology. And they all had this problem of you have the, the modem, the DSL modem in one corner of the house, you have the TVs elsewhere, and how do you connect those up? And so our first products were basically just video senders and receivers. They would be Wi-Fi access points as well, but their primary purpose was to very reliably transmit these multi-megabit streams of paid video content around the home. A lot of, a lot of people thought we're crazy for trying to this in unlicensed spectrum, or even 2.4 gigahertz, because you know this is stuff that like this is your this is your real pay TV. If this stuff doesn't work, it's gonna this stuff's coming back, and it's gonna cause a huge customer support problem for uh, uh, for the customers. We actually sold millions of these. Um, it, it it did work. Uh, Based on having control of both ends of the system, we were able to get enough gain, and through our antenna techniques, that we were able to make it very reliable. And there was essentially a you know negligible return rate of of these devices. Turns out that wasn't a, a hugely wonderful business. The gross margins on that, that type of equipment were were pretty low, and so uh, we were looking for sort of what the next thing would be. And so we decided to take that same technology, mostly our adaptive antenna technology, which I'll talk about in a second, and apply that to, to business Wi-Fi. And we started doing that around the 2007 time frame, which was uh, fortunately around the same time the, the iPhone started to uh, make its appearance. And that was a uh, sort of an inflection point uh, again for Wi-Fi. Um, and we were able to ride that uh, quite, quite nicely. Around 2009, the impact of all those Wi-Fis, uh, all those Wi-Fi phones uh, started really taking a toll on the cellular networks, and we started doing deployments in various places with uh, carriers who uh, wanted to offload their 3G networks with Wi-Fi. And then um, about two years ago, uh, we were lucky, my co-founders and I were lucky enough to ring the, the, uh, the opening bell in the New York Stock Exchange. A lot of people ask me what it was like to ring the New York uh, Stock Exchange, you know, be on the floor of the Stock Exchange there. And if you've ever been to Vegas, well, it's almost the same. A lot of noise, a lot of flashing lights, and a lot of people dressed in weird suits running around. So it's uh, draw your own conclusions about uh, about that. But uh, that was my impression. So um, Beamflex. Beamflex is kind of the uh, the technology, how, how we've branded our adaptive antenna software, the combination of uh, software control of these, these uh, adaptive antennas. and uh, it's really served to be a performance and competitive advantage uh, for us for uh, you know, quite some time. And it's still sort of one of the things that we're, we're better known for. Um, and numerous patents issued for this technology over the years. Uh, a lot of them covering the radio, sorry, a lot of them covering the antenna structures, uh, a lot of them covering some of the aspects of, of uh, the software algorithms. So here's an example of one of our adaptive antennas. You know, literally all of our products have these. And we have, you know, I don't know, dozens of products at this point, uh, probably approaching, uh, you know, I don't know, we've probably done 50 different products over the years at this point. Uh, all of them have 
custom design antennas, uh, generally they tend not to get reused that much. There'll be some products that will reuse an antenna, but uh, for the most part, the packaging will change. Generally, there's a trend towards smaller APs. Uh, there's a trend towards more and more radio chains. Uh, the capabilities of the radio change, which uh, sort of necessitate a, uh, a re-optimization of the antenna. So we've gotten, uh, we've done a lot of these uh, over the years. They're all slightly different, different principles involved in some of them. But um, you know, the key aspects we're talking about, they're all under software control. This is where the software control lines come. Generally, they're, they're controlling something like pin diodes on, uh, on these PCBs, which can uh, cause reflectors or directors to appear or disappear around the radiating elements to affect the patterns of the antennas. And um, all of our modern ones are dual polarized because that's a great way of making use of uh, something nature gives you for free is these two orthogonal propagation modes. At least they start out completely uh, orthogonal, which is great for uh, spatial multiplexing. So here's just an example of a, some random antenna pattern from one of our, uh, one of our antennas. Um, might you know look somewhat like you expect there'd be there's a notch and there's gain and uh, it's it's not a it's not an omnidirectional pattern basically is my point here. Um, here's a superposition of all the patterns for one of one particular antenna that we called the hex. Um, some of these patterns are irrelevant that you would never actually use in practice. Um, but you can see I think there's probably 64 patterns here. Um, out of those, there's a half dozen or so that uh, you'd consider to be uh, very useful in a number of different situations. So uh, in this context, um, the choice, the, the goal would be to select an antenna pattern that's going to uh, result in the best channel conditions, the best throughput uh, for a particular user. So a quick note on some of the advantages of, an, of adaptive antennas. You get, uh, you get gain because you're able to have a non-omnidirectional, you're able to put sort of more signal gain in some particular directions. Um, you have interference reduction because you're not radiating 360 degrees. Uh, you can uh, essentially uh, manage where you are radiating to some extent and cause uh, less interference in some directions. You, you, one of the biggest sources of gain is actually from being able to control multipath. If you have a traditional single spatial stream um, type situation, maybe a client, your client device only has a single antenna, it's, that situation is highly sensitive to multipath. It can get in a null and the signal can fade dramatically. Um, you can just get unlucky. Motion in the environment, all these sorts of things can uh, affect the, the multipath and, and cause a, a client to have a very bad experience. By being able to nudge that pattern around, you can get out of the unlucky propagation environments. You can take some guy who was in a fade and just by changing the pattern almost randomly, you can get him out of that fade with some, uh, with some high probability. Um, this becomes actually even more important when you're talking about spatial multiplexing because you having that degree of control over the, the chains independently, you can increase the probability that those different streams are going to arrive decorrelated at the receiver, which is again what you need for them to be resolved and, and be decoded. If they're perfectly correlated, then spatial multiplexing breaks down. So you have to have a tool in your chest so that when your multipath gets unlucky or if, you're, if there's not enough natural multipath to begin with, um, you have a way of sort of decorrelating those, those streams um, to allow spatial multiplexing to work with some higher probability. And it's nice that as we get transmit beamforming, sort of traditional phase uh, based beamforming, uh, this, this technique is added onto that. This is additional degrees of freedom that exist on top of that. So now uh, we're going to make a modified problem statement including this adaptive antenna technology. And so now we need to do what we were doing before with all those physical data rates, but now we also have to select a transmission antenna pattern for every transmission, which dramatically increases the optimization space, as I'll, I'll show shortly. Um, so now we need to decide on a goodness metric. Um, you know, it, what you, want, you obviously want it to be highly correlated to the user experience um, and the deployment objectives. It turns out for Wi-Fi, most of the deployment objectives are about data. You know, not, I mean, some people run voice over Wi-Fi, and if you're optimizing a network for voice, like the cellular network originally was, you, you, make, you do make different decisions. But fortunately, most Wi-Fi networks are deployed for capacity and care about throughput. And so that makes the choice of the goodness metric um, 
a little bit easier. You, can, you want something that's essentially correlated with throughput because that's more or less going to correlate with the user experience. But devices aren't continuously transmitting usually. Um, you know, they have some natural amount of data that they're trying to move. So you can't look at the actual throughput. You can't just count the bytes that they transmitted divided by time and call that their throughput because most of the time they weren't transmitting. Uh, what you need is their, you need to figure out their saturation throughput, the throughput they would be achieving if they were transmitting continuously. Um, because that's the, that's the value that, that really correlates with an individual user's experience. And of course, even a radio may be transmitting 100% of the time, but it's transmitting, of course, of course to, to multiple clients in some sort of round-robin fashion. And so um, you, you have to break out the individual user components of that. And so uh, we find this potential throughput, or I'll call it estimated throughput. It's really, we're trying to get to the saturation throughput of a particular client, what he, what he would be receiving if he, he were to saturate the link. And just a note, you may be figuring out, this is all from an AP-centric point of view. Uh, you know, we're implementing these algorithms on Wi-Fi APs. But the same concepts, concepts would apply to a, a Wi-Fi client device as well. Uh, but with Wi-Fi, both ends make their rate decisions independently. So the AP is deciding its rate when it, it, for every transmission. Similarly, a client device is figuring out its rate uh, for every transmission using its own algorithm. And of course, our, our throughput metric, we want that to be in, in megabits per second. Um, that's kind of the most satisfying uh, uh, way of thinking about throughput, of course. Um, so here's how, we, here's how we estimate throughput. Uh, it's basically you, you make a Mac, through, Mac layer model of, of Wi-Fi. Uh, you take into account the various overheads, um, the, the back offs, the, the channel access times, all these types of, of factors. Um, and you end up with two primary inputs that you need for every transmission. You need, you need to know the fire rate that that transmission was set at, and you need to know the packet error rate over some number of transmissions, the probability that the packet is going to be errored. Uh, and again, we get that information immediately after every transmission in the form of an acknowledgment. In the case of a, a single packet transmission, it's uh, one bit of information we get per transmission. In the case of an aggregate, when we've aggregated multiple frames up to you know, approximately you know, 30, uh, 32 frames, you can get up to 32 bits of, of feedback for every transmission, which is nice. Um, and you can update this calculation after every transmission. You can um, you know, make a selection, see the result of that selection, then update your model of the, th of the estimated throughput to that client. And so now we know what we're, you know, roughly what we're trying to optimize. And so we can have a, um, a final problem statement, uh, which incorporates this, this notion of the highest estimated throughput. Now I still have highest in square, scare quotes because Throughput is not a single number. Nothing with wireless is ever sort of a single number. It's always a statistical distribution. So we still have to deal with this concept of what it really means to be the highest. And that, that turns out to be sort of the crux of the problem here and where we need to sort of fall back to some statistical techniques um, that actually make this a little bit interesting. Um, and of course, we have additional real world constraints here, uh, some of which are pretty severe. Um, we have to do this in C language, uh, so no fun Python libraries. Um, this is a resource-constrained resource embedded system. Uh, we're in kernel space, just to keep it interesting, uh, which also means there's all sorts of legal requirements now uh, around the GPL. And so this thing has to have no dependencies on the, on the Linux kernel itself. It has to be this completely standalone piece of code that uh, does not derive from the Linux kernel in any way that a lawyer uh, would be able to argue. Um, we need to do this state update and parameter selection very quickly. Um, we're going to make a selection, do a transmission. Now, after that transmission, immediately we get a feedback. We have to update the model and make a, the next selection in the interpacket gap for the next transmission. Because otherwise, the feedback isn't taken into account for the next transmission. So this has to happen effectively in interrupt context. As we're handling the interrupt from the chip saying, hey, this last packet was just went out and it was either success or not success. In that interrupt context, while we're waiting to send the next packet, you know, typically, you know, typically sub millisecond, you hope, if, you're, if your network's not, um, not too crazy, um, it could be tens of microseconds uh, to sort of low single digit milliseconds that you need to make this, um, this state update and this next decision. 
which turns out to be a pretty severe implementation constraint as far as like how you sort of start to look at this problem. So drilling down a bit, um, here's a 2D projection projection of our the space that we're trying to optimize, and sort of the objective is find the best one. We've kind of defined the best as the one that has the highest estimated throughput. So you can conceptually think of us having a a two-dimensional table. You have phi rates over here, and you have antenna patterns over here, and our goal now is to somehow sort through this whole table, search through this whole space, and find the one that has the absolute highest estimated throughput. This is a, a 2D projection, as I mentioned, because the certainly the phi rates are actually multidimensional. If you recall back to those phi tables, you have spatial streams, this is effectively one dimension, your modulation encodings, another dimension, your channelizations, another dimension, the, um, the uh, guard intervals, another dimension. So this is, you have at least four dimensions. Uh, in here, this is just kind of, you kind of just project it down to one. Uh, and oftentimes the antennas also have structure that you can think of as being multidimensional. Um, so in reality, this isn't really two-dimensional, but you can think of it that way. So <clears throat> just one other note, um, just the orders of magnitude we're talking about here. Our phi rates, we're talking about tens to hundreds of phi rates and tens to hundreds of antenna patterns, depending on our particular um, antenna design. So we're talking about a space that's hundreds to you know, 10,000 uh, entries that we need to sort of sort through. So that's clearly uh, daunting. And so let's try to break that up a little bit. Uh, so just as an implementation um, method, uh, we can use some heuristics to do this optimization in stages. We don't need to optimize across that entire space at once. Um, we can do it in stages and we can iterate, do it iteratively based on that. And it turns out there's a lot of nice properties um, of the phi rates in particular that allow you to do that without worrying too much about uh, uh, getting into a, a local maxima. And so really what we're talking about is, you, you know, you do some optimization, we'll I'll ignore sort of the corner case of how you actually start all this, but you do some optimization, you end up with a winner, you select some subspace related to that winner, do an optimization, out pops a new um, best um, result from that reduced search, from that initial search space, and then you kick off another search across this, um, this new space that was um, chosen based on the winner of the previous round. So you're doing these sort of iterative um, optimizations here. And so now we have to figure out you know, the details of actually how you do this space, um, you know, this, this, this subspace selection, um, I won't get into, but uh, the key problem we have to solve now is given this sort of reduced search space of, let's say, tens of, of elements, uh, how do we find for sure a uh, one that we're going to call the best in the quickest amount of time possible? So now we need to turn to some statistics. Um, you can model this as essentially each transmission is a Bernoulli trial. It has some result. Uh, you, you select a phi rate, you select an antenna, and the combination of that and, and the client's position and the whole environment results in some probability of success for that transmission. We would prefer it to be 100%. It never is. It's you know something like. Uh, 95% to 50% in, in practice. Um, so we can build a model around where all these different choices have this uh, these packet error rates associated with them, and our goal is to estimate those pa uh, those packet error rates with some uh, acceptable level of error. Now, of course, if you have infinite time, you can sample each pattern, each choice an infinite number of times and know for sure which one's the best. Um, anything else requires some level of approximation because you always have some uh, statistical distribution resulting from the, the samples that you actually see. Uh, but of course, seeing those, uh, the sampling all the non-optimal choices is very expensive. By definition, you really want to be spending all your time on the optimal choice, but yet you're forced to sample non-optimal choices just to assess whether they potentially are the best choice. Um, so how do you how to perform this optimal sampling? Well, so now uh, if you dig into sort of some academic research, you can find uh, a problem called the multi-armed -arm, bandit problem. Um, 
I guess, in, it's from statistics. Um, and it's, it seems to be well researched, but the implementation constraints here are so severe that I wasn't really able to um, apply much of what I learned from, from studying this to this problem. So we had to uh, take a slightly different approach, still based on statistics. And so we found this one weird real-time trick, uh, basing this all on binomial proportion confidence intervals, which have some nice properties um, that sort of match with intuition here, which, which I'll describe. Um, so they're, they're really a, um, confidence intervals are an intuitive way of quantifying uncertainty. And they, uh, turns out they provide a, a pretty satisfying path to uh, minimizing the uncertainty and, and uh, figuring out how to do the sampling here. Uh, the really nice thing about them is we can implement them using lookup tables. We can uh, track um, number of successes or failures and total number of, of transmission attempts as an input to a, uh, a table. And out of that table can pop confidence intervals that have been pre-computed in sort of fixed point style. Uh, you can do this with you know, fairly modest memory requirements, covering the sort of the, the ranges of uh, resolution that you really need. There's lots of different ways of computing um, confidence intervals. Uh, and the details of those aren't really relevant here. Uh, here's the normal approximation. Um, you know, the key thing just kind of for the intuition is that as you increase the number of samples, your error bounds decrease in proportion to the square root of the number of samples. So you need four times as many samples to half the size of your, um, your confidence intervals. So just a, a more concrete example. If you, if you did 12 transmissions and had three failures, um, by one method of calculating the confidence intervals, you would come up with a PER bound, a packet error rate bound, that's somewhere between uh, 0.07 and 0.53. Pretty, pretty wide range. Uh, to translate that into our favorite units of, of megabits, if you uh, had that same example in megabits, that would be somewhere between 4.7 and, and 9.3. And this is a, a vastly simplified MAC model, ignoring all overheads. So now we need to address the, one of the final issues of what it means to have a best choice. Um, and one of the, the concepts that we come to here is that you're looking for a disjoint confidence interval. You can say a choice is best when its lower confidence interval bound is greater than the upper confidence interval bounds of all the other choices. Essentially, you've remove the uncertainty from the equation. If there's overlap, there's uncertainty. A way of looking at that is, uh, visually, is here, where uh, sort of trying to draw the, the megabits uh, of the confidence intervals here. So here's one choice that has a, a confidence interval ranging from somewhere up here to somewhere down here. Here's another choice that has a confidence interval from here to here. We have this amount of overlap between the confidence intervals. You can think of this as the uh, the uncertainty that we want to uh, drive out of the system. As long as you have overlap like that, you can't say for sure that this particular choice is, is better than this choice. So this is the desired end state. If you had two choices, you really want to see their confidence intervals not overlapping at all. You want their confidence intervals to be disjoint. And now you can say, uh, with some level of statistical certainty, that B is the better choice. Um, and that level of statistical certainty is actually controlled by you by how, by the, the confidence percentile. If you, if you drew these confidence intervals, if you calculate your tables at the 90th percentile, they would be much wider. If you calculate them at the, uh, at the 80th percentile, they're going to get narrower. So you can control the degree of, of confidence you need in, uh, in your results by controlling the uh, sort of the width of the, the confidence per, uh, percentiles. So this this is sort of satisfying because it's you're making a claim that this is statistically I'm statistically certain, and that sort of the level of certainty is under your control. So another way to think about this, uh, if you have a set of bunch of choices, if you just look at the uh, the maximum of the upper CIs of the upper band of the, uh, upper end of the confidence intervals for all of them, and if you look at the um, maximum of the lower confidence interval for all of them, consider that range, 
you want to drive all the overlap out of that range for all the other choices. You want exactly one choice to overlap with that, which is essentially the one that's supplying both of those, and that's the best choice. So now that we know what the sort of the desired end state is, is to have some statistically optimal choice, how do we, uh, how do we go about selecting for every transmission the, uh, the choice that will actually uh, get us there? And so, describe this here is we can actually quantify the expected reduction that we would get from selecting a choice. Given their current confidence intervals, we know that we can calculate, we can sort of play it forward one and look at where that confidence interval is likely to end up because we have some information for that. Uh, we can project that if we select this choice and it continues to perform like it had previously based on sort of its, the samples that we have for it, what is likely to be its new confidence interval? And so you can now say that you can now look at the expected reduction in that confidence interval overlap. Remember that confidence inter interval overlap is what we're trying to drive out of the system. That's the uncertainty we're trying to drive out of the system. We can estimate how much uncertainty we'll drive out of the system for each of our possible selections. And then we just have to pick the selection that actually drives out the most uncertainty. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty satisfying to think about it as, as a system that's just trying to drive uncertainty away. And, uh, and, and makes the best choice that, that does that. And because we're, by definition, only considering choices that are essentially overlapping with the best choice, um, it's not like we're wasting time on lots of irrelevant choices. We're, we're, by definition here, we're only spending time on choices that are, are contenders, essentially, because the overlap region is overlapping with the best uh, likely choice, the best potential choice. And so, you just iterate on this with this process. After every transmission, you update the confidence intervals based on the result, and you can actually update one forward the expected confidence interval after the next uh, reduction, after the next transmission, and then so you you keep things sorted by not only these confidence intervals but also the expected reduction in the confidence interval, and then you have sort of a simple O of one uh, selection process by just uh, uh, looking at the top of that that list sorted by expected confidence interval uh, overlap reduction. So of course, a major caveat here is we're assuming a static environment, which um, you know you certainly have some environments that are, are approximately static for some amount of time, uh, but you also have other environments that are much more dynamic. So to actually adapt this framework to a, uh, a dynamic environment takes uh, a lot more a lot more thought and work. But um, we've done that and have been pretty pretty satisfied with the results. Um, so you might think there's probably lots of other ways of doing rate adaptation and or antenna adaptation. A lot of people sort of start with the notion of this modem, you know, chugging down through rates until it finds what it likes. Um, and that breaks pretty quickly in real life because you get these situations where um, you have periodic interference sources and the answer uh, when you're impacted by one of these periodic inf interference resources. If you turn down the rate, you actually increase the probability that you'll be impacted by it. And so the coding, the additional gains from coding that you get from decreasing the rate are totally counterbalanced by the fact that your transmissions are much larger. And so that's the exact wrong thing to do. In many cases, it actually, you would benefit from turning up the rate. Very counterintuitive. Um, up until recently, many iPhones actually s suffered from this problem. Uh, and not just iPhones, many other other devices as well. They would just crater the fire rate. You'd see them sitting around in one megabit when they could be, uh, you know, they should be up, you know, 20, 30 megabits. Um, so this type of this type of algorithm is very robust against uncertainty in the environment. It doesn't depend on any knowledge of RF. It doesn't depend on any knowledge of fire rates, their structure, what's really going on. It doesn't depend on any antenna characteristics. It's really just looking at, at outcomes and looking at sort of ranges of outcomes and, and gravitating towards those outcomes that uh, produce the best objective result that is, is important to the user. A lot of people coming from a radio design background wonder why we don't just have, uh, you know, do traditional radio engineering things based on the RSSI to sort of, they think that that should be such this 
huge hint of this, these RSSI measurements, but it turns out that RSSI measurements are also practically useless because um, these chipsets are not calibrated lab instruments. In fact, the RSSI outputs are sort of a side effect of their AGC process, and they um, they include all sorts of artifacts that are, are highly undesirable, and it's not uncommon for them to have, you know, 10 dB of error. So um, RSSI has, uh, is sort of sends a lot of people down a um, uh, sort of an unfortunate path when trying to develop a rate control algorithm. So uh, we found that this algorithm is very robust against sort of uncertainties in the environment and really even weird chipset bugs. You have certain chips that just for whatever reason a fire rate fails. It's you know some implementation error. It's some corner case, some some weird um, um, artifact, and this just doesn't care. This doesn't care if it's a chip problem, it's an environment problem, an antenna problem. Uh, an antenna cable is disconnected. It's going to do the best thing to uh, to adapt to that, regardless of, of what's going on. And so it turns out once you have these techniques, these sort of statistical toolkits and um, good ways of, of measuring throughput, you can do other optimizations in the wireless system using these same things. We do uh, something similar for the operating channel. Uh, it's kind of a, a very novel approach to sl channel selection where um, you're actually using the channel and quantifying the, the performance of the channel by using it. A lot of people try to do passive sniffing of channels to do a channel selection, but it turns out a passive sniffing is a one-ended thing. Uh, you, it doesn't take into account noise at the receiver. It doesn't take into account all sorts of other factors that really impact the um, the usability of a channel. Turns out until you've actually used a channel, something that has a feedback mechanism, uh, you can't really tell how uh, good a channel is going to be. And of course, there's lots of other MAC and baseband parameters that can be adapted uh, based on uh, these similar techniques. Uh, so in summary, um, we've described here a throughput-based optimization metric, which is very close to the actual user experience and very um, unlikely to be to produce um, false results like uh, like a, uh, a metric like RSSI would. Um, what I'll call a statistically optimal kernel, which knows how to navigate, um, which knows how to select from a, a, a set of, of of different choices in, in an optimal fashion in the, in the shortest amount of time, and a, a, a heuristic to sort of tie it all together to segment the search space into an iteration of, of multiple um, of multiple optimizations. And so. Um, you know, this is going on as we speak. Uh, you know, probably millions of APs around the world, um, hotels, airports, city of San Jose, city of San Francisco, uh, San, San Jose Airport and Convention Center. You can go uh, go use those networks and uh, get on them and and think about uh, when you're when you're downloading YouTube, uh, you know, cat videos. What's going on on these APs a thousand times a second, literally working to uh, you know optimize your experience. It's kind of a, kind of fun to think about it that way. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Well, if no one else is going to start, I'm going to start. Sure. So it, it would seem to me that the uh, that the uh, ACK mechanism um, is really fundamentally limiting uh, in the sense that when the receiver receives something, it has a tremendous amount of forensic information about the channel at that time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if more of that were, maybe you said this when I was out of the room, but if more of that information could somehow be characterized and sent back to the transmitter, mm -hmm. you could build better models and, and, and converge more quickly. Mm -hmm. Can you comment, is that true? How do you view it? Yes. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, 802.11 uh, transmit beamforming does have this channel assessment capability. And it's used primarily for um, Designing for calculating the steering vectors for for transmit beamforming, it has um, you know essentially phase information on all the subcarrier basis. Um, that information um, is is definitely there. Uh, we've looked at other ways we could potentially use that information, and there certainly are uses for that. Um, we haven't. I guess we're still fairly early in the transmit beamforming transition, but most chipsets don't support it yet, and so it's something that um, you know we—it's not a—it's not yet a ubiquitous source of, of feedback for us. I can imagine other things that the receiver are, could also, other sources of feedback they could also provide. Uh, I think the question would be then, um, you know, sort of the cost. Uh, you know, how do how do you how do you get chips to actually implement that sort of thing? 
because most other, you know, anything other than their, their base function is scrutinized for sort of cost and power um, concerns. Um, so are you asking how, to, how do we validate the algorithm? Or? So that's a good question. So it depends, it, it depends on uh, a, a few factors. It depends on the fire rates that you're actually talking about, how many of them are, are uh, how many antennas you have, how many antennas are um, contenders. The, 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 the fact of this algorithm is that it very quickly it very quickly discards things that aren't contenders or, or close to the contender. Um, it spends all of its time trying to um, resolve the last you know the last ten percent of or twenty percent of differences. Things that are very are vastly different are are immediately apparent. So the question uh, one of the questions one of the ways we characterize the algorithm is how long it takes to get within ninety percent of optimal. Or, or 80 percent of optimal, and that depends on other factors. But in general, um, most transmissions with 802.11 are in a in a busy environment. You're typically looking at something on the order of one to four milliseconds, and that will have um, you know 10, let's say order of 10 uh, transmission sub you know subframes in that. And so you're getting you're you're essentially getting a lot of feedback in a fairly short amount of time. You know, literally thousands of of um, transmissions every second. And so typically, what you're looking at is that it's it's on the range of you know 50 to 100 milliseconds to get within you know, let's say 80 percent of optimal, and then you know it sort of asymptotically goes up uh, from there. But it's it's definitely it's definitely a feedback rich environment. Um, you know there are lots of transmissions, retransmissions count too, um, and so you know to the extent that you're unlucky in your early selections, which results in fire rates or antenna combinations that don't work, you still get to retransmit those and retry them. It's not great from a user throughput standpoint, but from a feedback standpoint, you're still getting that feedback very quickly, um, and so it does tend to uh, you know converge pretty quickly. Yeah, so uh, what I wanted to know was in terms of the optimization, uh, when you're analyzing these different uh, candidates and the contenders, uh, and you're trying to hit that uh, threshold of 90% certainty or higher, mm -hmm. in case that doesn't happen, are there any fail safe mechanisms for uh, being okay with an 85% certainty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So, um, so one. One observation I'll make is that if things, if you have two choices that are so that are are relatively similar, uh, so similar that there's a lot of that there's ambiguity about which one's best, it sort of doesn't matter which one you're using because you're probably in the right ballpark. And so, um, you know, driving that last bit of uncertainty out of the system isn't that expensive from a user experience uh, standpoint because these are you're comparing choices that are roughly similar to begin with. There, there are additional um, there are additional mechanisms. I mean just the, just from an implementation standpoint, um, just the nature of the tables, the tables have to be bounded uh, from you know the number of samples that we can uh, you know, look up. And so you know at some point you you have a certain number of samples and you say, you know this this hasn't converged. Uh, I'm, I'm close enough. Let's just kick off another stage with the best that I have at this point. Sure. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, one thing I think you touched on, you know, a fair amount, but um, I was uh, I, I missed something probably was. Um, I, I view this sort of as a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, which is you know very popular in evolutionary algorithms and also mm -hmm. these multi-armed mm -hmm. bandits. Um, and I think 
you know, the, so in this context, I would it, w- it would be something like on the one hand, you want to pull the arm, you know, with the with the best uh, bandwidth, mm-hmm. according to your definition of bandwidth. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you're never sure that there could be another arm out there that you're not pulling, right? Because you haven't tried it, because mm-hmm. you don't, you know, you you were never in the position um, to to do that. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and I think that relates to you, you know the discussion about those overlapping confidence intervals. Mm-hmm. Um, have you, you know, have you thought about it from that perspective, this sort of exploration versus exploitation? That's if very you, good. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this we we have that exact concept in the actual production algorithm. Um, you have a concept of a of a search process and the concept of a cache process and uh, you you can manage between those two the the search process is responsible for dredging up novel potential combinations and the cache is responsible for uh, maintaining the known good ones and then you have a, a mechanism to allocate between the two as conditions warrant so in the actual implementation, that, that does become a, a key implementation uh, uh, point. So you met, you, you talked about um, the, the folks in the chat room. Any uh, questions from uh, online participants at this point? Okay, let's take Abe's question first, and then uh, we'll go online. Sure. So, yeah. So it turns out that trying to explicitly model changes in the environment is is difficult. Um, we can use some of these same statistical techniques, um, and we have experimented with things like that, trying to say with some statistical certainty that the environment has sort of irrevocably changed. And thus, we need to sort of start the optimization over for some more sane uh, starting point. Uh, so the actual logic that drives the multi-stage uh, aspects of this implementation does try to um, incorporate a model of, of has the environment changed enough that, that I need to reset things. And uh, that's definitely an area that's that's difficult and probably an area that uh, could benefit from some more attention. Sure. So we're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but let me... Uh, ask the last questions. So I'm very interested in the, uh, the development process and in particular the tools that you use. Once you have the statistical model you know, and understanding physical reality, mm-hmm. you pose the question, well, you've created a theory of how to do this. Mm-hmm. And now the question is, does your approach actually achieve the optimal? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm interested in, in your comments about how you used real world instrumentation data and or simulation and modeling mm-hmm. in order to val- validate what you've, uh, what you've done. Sure. Yeah, so you really need to lean heavily on the simulated environments here. Um, you, you, of course, need to use real environments as well. Um, but real environments are hard to create the level of richness uh, in a repeatable fashion. Um, and so, yeah, we do aim, we do lean heavily on simulated environments. We have a tool we call BeamSim, which um, is essentially it's a combination unit test and simulation environment for, for this algorithm. And, um, you know, it's basically a bunch of Python. Uh, it's a, you know, very simple RF simulator in, in Python. Um, and it's sophisticated enough we can actually import our antenna patterns into it. And so it sets up simulated environments where we know the answer. We know what the optimal antenna pattern and fire rate is because the simulator selected it. And then it presents that environment to the algorithm. And then we, we track how, it, uh, how the algorithm actually, how quickly it can actually get to the optimal or within some certain percentage of the, uh, of the optimal choice. And then, of course, we do it a billion times to look at the CDF of that and 
there's all sorts of different ways you can sort of analyze the performance of an algorithm like this. Uh, um, but probably the, the, the most relevant is sort of time to some threshold of optimal, time to 90% uh, of optimal, something like that. All right. Well, uh, let's thank our speaker. Bill. Thank you. Thanks.